get started. Welcome, everyone. I am um, Kara Lee Hall, and this is the rest of the PHW team on here tonight. We're going to be talking about our overdose um, response grant writing. We have um, a lot planned and then some time for some question and answers, but before we get started, um, we're going to have a quick prayer. So if you would pray with me. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day and this chance to be together and to discuss and talk and learn about the ways that we can support your people here um, in a Catholic state. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just a little um, look at our agenda for the evening. And we're going to go over some project ideas and resources. Special considerations, funding budget, um, marketing, different things like that, as well as your eligibility for grants, and questions and answers um, section. So just a little bit about, um, we can go to the next slide, please. Just a little bit about partners in health and wholeness. We're an initiative of the North Carolina Council of Churches. Um, what we do, we work to bridge issues of faith, health, and justice. Um, and we empower health, faith communities to improve their health and well-being. Um, so we partner and support grassroots efforts to challenge injustices. We do this. So how do we do this? We do this by providing resources, connections, and support to faith communities. Um, we also work to establish trust and partnership with our faith communities, um, and we offer many grants and community grants to support faith communities' health initiatives, which is what we're here to talk a little bit about tonight, our overdose um, grants more specifically. Um, and we do this because we believe that all people are loved by God um, and that God cares about the wholeness of humanity and mind, body, and spirit. Um, so we really are striving through our work um, and and supporting you, our work in partnership with um, faith communities across the state. And we hope that ultimately this will improve health outcomes for um, all North Carolinians. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Donna Hill, who's gonna go over more specifics about um, our overdose grant and project ideas. Good evening, everyone. Um, like Carly said, I'm Donna Hill. I am the project coordinator for the overdose response and tobacco nicotine education. And we just wanted to um, kind of go over some of the different opioid projects and initiatives that you could do um, or propose when you're applying for one of the, the mini grants for the opioid initiatives. So um, this slide here, this is actually on our website. So I'm not gonna read it all word for word. I know a lot of you may have seen it already, um, but it just gives you some sample ideas of different initiatives that you can do with the mini grant funding. Um, and it gives you some examples of what you can put in your budget for each of the different each of the different things. Um, and I'm going to talk just a little bit more about that when we get into the budget section. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about were um, are the speaker resources? What resources do we have for speakers that can come, um, for example, to town hall forums or town hall meetings or anything like that? Um, there are a lot of free resources out there that are available to us. And um, this is kind of just a collection of some of them that are out there. Um, that I wanted to share with everyone. You do not normally need to pay speakers because we do have these as free resources. Um, the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition, 
There are local harm reduction um, collectives in uh, across the state, not in every area, but um, some scattered out throughout the state. County health departments are a great resource. Um, the state health department, um, the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, when you want to talk about the topic of the opioid funding in your county and what that's looking like from um, the settlement funds. Um, local community paramedic teams that do post overdose response, uh, local substance use coalitions. Um, a lot of counties have that and you can reach out to them through the health department a lot of times. Uh, local college professors, people in recovery. Don't forget about people who are in recovery of substance use disorder. They're great speakers as well to kind of tell their story and give a good perspective of um, what that looks like. And then also, of course, the, the North Carolina Council of Churches and us on the, the Partners in Health and Wholeness team um, and the and Olive Branch Ministries, which covers a lot of the counties in the um, western central part of the state. And some, just a couple of special considerations, just in case you don't know, um, for a syringe service program in North Carolina, you have to create a safety plan and have that approved by the state and filed with the state to actually do syringe service programs. Um, if you don't have that, you can work with um, other syringe service programs in your area and you can always, you know, use money to buy them supplies to house them in your um, in your uh, facility, um, but to actually give out supplies and do a syringe service program yourself, you have to you have to do that through the state. So. Um, and then for medication take backs events, um, if you're not sure what that is, that's just where you have an event where you have people bring their um, unused or expired uh, medications that they have at home. It can be over the counter or prescription and they bring them to this event to make sure that they get disposed of properly. You, um, I have seen a lot of uh, faith communities do that on a Sunday morning and do a service around it. Um, but you do have to have a law enforcement officer present during that time um, in case you get any controlled substances that are brought in. And then once all of that is collected, the law enforcement officer takes that with them and they have a place that they properly dispose of all of those unused medications. And so next we'll talk a little bit about funding and budgets real quickly. Um, we wanted to talk about what we're looking for and what we're not looking for. Um, we are looking for budget proposals that spend their funds in a responsible and pro programmatic way. Um, you know, we want to really see you make a difference with, with um, you know, what we are able to award you, even though it's, it's not a huge amount. Um, but the things, some of the things that we're not really looking for is um, in budgets, we don't really want, as far as the opioid mini grants go, um, for the funds to be spent on door prizes or incentives, um, and not necessarily on speakers, because as I went over earlier, there are a lot of free uh, speaker resources throughout the state. However, there, there is a, a caveat to the speakers, like if you want to possibly pay them for a travel reimbursement because they came from far away, or if you want to do an, an honorarium because they have worked with you several times to kind of get your program going, they've been a speaker for you, they've done several things to kind of help you out along the way, um, that might be a special circumstance. What we are looking for in a budget proposal is things like... Um, using the funds to purchase Narcan or Naloxone, which is the medication that reverses um, an opioid overdose. There's also dispensing or vending machines that you can you can purchase that um, the Naloxone or the Narcan goes into so that anybody is available to anybody at any time. Um, you can spend it on promotion of events. 
Um, you can spend it on um, supplies for uh, if you're working with a local certain service program, implementation of a book or Bible studies where you buy materials for that to learn more about um, the opioid crisis and response and harm reduction, um, hosting recovery groups at your facility. So and then the, the topic of meals has has come up as well. And I know sometimes you have to provide food to get people there. And um, so that's OK, too, as, lo as long as that's not like your whole budget or um, the majority of your budget. And I am going to pass it along now to my colleague, um, Reverend Dr. Arlisa Simmons. Good evening. And so while you are able to spend some of your budget on the promotion of projects and events, we want to make sure that you are utilizing the resources that are already in existence that you're probably using to promote the events and the other activities of your congregation. So we know that it could possibly be some anxiety as you are trying to promote these new initiatives. And so what we wanna talk about for the first couple of minutes is how to reach the people you are trying to reach. Um, first, you need to decide who are we trying to reach? Who is our audience? And so this program may be different than some of the previous programs that you've held at church. So you may have to strategically sit down in your planning and talk through who are the people we're trying to reach and then how do we get information to their ears and their eyes? We do understand that we are all competing for the attention of people. And so I wanted to go through a couple of ways in which you can consider promoting your, proje your projects. We call these old school or traditional methods of communication. Now, it's likely that you've already used some of these messages through public service announcements and radio announcements. When you send public service announcements, usually you're going to write a narrative and send that to the local newspaper or send that to the radio station. It's gonna include your five W's and your H, the who, what, when, where, why, and the how. You're gonna make sure that they know the time, the date, the place, if the event is free, and what other information you're gonna put a contact information. You likely already do this to get the information out about your church in congregational events. Make sure when you do your PSAs, you do it in the amount of time needed so that they can be planned into the programming of the radio station or they can be scheduled for publication in any printed advertisements. And then you also want to rely on your local newspapers or targeted publications in your community. And so in your local community, it's the same concept of putting the five W's in the H, making sure that the person who's compiling the data don't have to call and ask any questions. I used to be a newspaper reporter and I was the person putting together this information. And it was likely that your information would go in the newspaper if I got all the information I needed without having to follow up. And you also want to put that on your church's news, uh, your uh, uh, stationary, so that they know it's an official announcement or send it from the church's email account so they will know it's a legitimate announcement. You also likely use text or phone trees in your congregation. As I was preparing for the night, there's often times where you will take uh, information from your visitors, their email address. This is an opportunity to possibly, if you're using their, you have their email addresses or your phone numbers from your visitors to invite that special population into this programming effort. And then traditional flyers. Now we know that there is a cost to printing flyers. However, we want to make sure that the um, monies that you may receive aren't being used primarily for printing, for printing large amounts of flyers, because we believe that you can use some new school methods to get the information out. Next slide. So the new school methods are methods that, methods that you're likely using the email blast where you are communicating to the members of your congregation or possibly to anyone who's been connected to your, con your church. You could possibly send out emails to other faith communities in your neighborhood so that they can spread the message. You could also use Facebook and post, uh, post and ads 
One of the other things, when you are creating your flyers and you're distributing them via email, be mindful of the format in which they're saved. So for example, if you save something in a PDF, that's perfect if someone is sharing that via email. But when it comes time to post it online, some people may have difficulty. I would screenshot it and then still post it on social media, but some others may have difficulty in sharing it. So please be sure that you're sharing it in a format, a JPEG or a PNG file, where people are going to be easily able to share it with their uh, community and their Facebook social media world. And then another thing we wanted to help make you mindful of is Google ads for nonprofits. So if your church uh, is has an account, a Gmail account, you may also be able to use Google ads, uh, which means you can place an ad in on the internet. And what it will allow for you to do is for people in your geographic area who are on the internet, who are searching, who are nearby, to know that you have an event coming up. And Stephanie's provide the email address so that you can do some further research on that. Next slide. And so, of course, we want to put our best foot forward. In some cases, you may have someone that you contract with for your digital products, but we use a product called Canva.com. There are a couple of versions of Canva.com. There is a free edition that does have lots of templates that you can use, and you'll likely see across social media. You're like, huh. Oh, I think I just saw a flyer that looks just like this. What it does is it allows you to use a template that's in existence, import the information that you want to communicate to the people that you're trying to get your information to, and it's in a beautiful, colorful design, and you can change the colors. Now, there is a free version and there is a pro version. You can do a trial of the pro version. Personally, I have a pro version. And of course, as an, as an organization, we have a pro version because we get all the bells and whistles. It's extremely user-friendly. There are lots of templates and that will allow you to have access to a number of ways in which you could uh, graphically share the information for your project. You could graphically create not only the flyers, but you could create uh, maybe a program or something that you would like to share physically as well as digitally. And so if we can assist in that way, we are here to help you getting the word out about your programming. So you don't have to spend a lot of money to do that. Hey everybody, my name is Stephanie Sanders. I am the Program and Engagement Administrator for uh, Partners in Health and Wholeness. And I'm just gonna go through quickly the logistics of how to apply for a grant. Now that we've told you kind of what we're looking for and how to you know, disseminate information about your project, um, I'm gonna tell you what the logistics are about how to actually go about funding. And I know a lot of you probably know this, so this is going to be a very short version, but don't worry, it's not a memory test. All of this information is on our website, and also I'm available to answer questions at any time. So the first step to applying for a grant is to join the PHW Collaborative, and you can find information at healthandwholeness.org slash collaborative. In order to apply for overdose funding, we need to receive your collaborative pledge no later than November 16th. This is because we need time to process your collaborative pledge before you submit your grant because the collaborative pledge acceptance email will contain the link to your grant application. So if you wanna apply for this cycle and this, this funding is only going to be available at this point until November 30th. So make sure you get your collaborative pledge in by November 16th to guarantee being able to apply in the cycle. Um, as I've said, the deadline to apply for the grant is November 30th and all award decisions will be made after that date. So you'll hear by mid-December about the result of your application. Want to quickly review with everyone the eligibility requirements for the collaborative pledge. You're eligible if you are a faith community that worships together regularly in the state of North Carolina. That's really the only threshold we're looking for there. We will verify this 
through your social media and your internet presence. And if we're not able to do that in those ways, we will follow up with you, but we will verify that you are worshiping faith community before we can approve your collaborative pledge. And you're eligible for a mini grant if you are an active member of the PHW Collaborative, which means you have a, a collaborative pledge on file within the last 12 months. And you also have not received a mini grant from us of any kind within the last 12 months. Now, a lot of I've gotten a lot of questions about the um, BIPOC mental health grants. And that is separate from our mini grant project. So you are still eligible to apply for this mini grant if you are a BIPOC mental health recipient. And if you have any questions, if you feel like you have a unique situation, you're not sure about the timing, I am happy to research your account for you and answer your questions individually as to your eligibility. Quick review, collaborative pledges, November 16th. Um, grant applications, November 30th. You'll find out mid-December. So if you have any questions about the collaborative process or your eligible, cchurches.org, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. We would like to open the floor up now to any questions that you have um, about anything that we've gone over. You can either put it in the chat or you can come off your mute and ask. Okay. No questions. Um, and you're always welcome to reach out to us if you if there's a question that does come up or that you're not sure about when you're applying um, or doing your budget or doing your um, program pro, um, program initiative um, part of the application. So just just reach out to us at at any time. Donna, there's one question in the chat about the range of the grants, the, the yeah. monetary range. So um, for this specific grant, the opioid grant, it is up to Okay. And if there are any other questions, we would like to close with a benediction and my colleague Chris is going to do that. And I want to say thank you to everyone who was on tonight. We really appreciate you being here with us. And I'm going to pass it over to Krista. Thanks, thanks so much. So, um, let's pray. May we go forth from our time together this evening with a spirit of compassion and a renewed sense of purpose that the work of our hands and of our hearts would ever honor the dignity and beauty of each of God's children. In gratitude for God's grace, we pray. Amen. <laughs>